Hi, welcome to another edition of Relatable. I am your host, Stephanie Michelle. This is a very exciting week for many people. We're entering into the holiday season of celebration. We get to see friends and family members. And maybe for some of us, it's also a reminder of things that are not quite so great in our country. And I think we're more aware of what divides us than we ever have been before. Um, yet there's little awareness around the common ground that affects all of us. And what I see is that issue is just how we're relating with each other. It's just not working. I mean, we're barely relating with each other. And this is something that we can all do, you know, we, that we all can contribute to fixing. Um, start by realizing some of your personal wellness, your personal relational wellness has been completely hijacked by political outrage and social outrage. I'm not saying that we should be passionate about things, but some of that, when we start to deliver all these like simulated thoughts, you know, we're picking up somebody else's thoughts and we're putting it out in a meme really quickly and we're not sitting down to talk each other with each other, some of that is really dangerous to how we feel uh, in terms of how we feel about each other. So I'm suggesting as we enter into this holiday season that we honor each other and our, we honor ourselves by really leaning into connecting and reconnecting over just personal stuff, you know, just really getting to know people. I mean, don't assume you know Aunt Betty. You could probably learn some new things about her. And the way that you do this is talk about your hopes and dreams, special memories, what made you laugh, greatest memory with your family. There's literally thousands of topics we can talk about over the holiday season that have nothing to do with the things that are upsetting us politically. So, and to help you with that, I've actually added some questions to our site. We have a hundred questions that you could ask family members. You could print them out, put them in a bowl, and just sit around and just connect. That's on the site right now under relational nourishment. So use these and let me know how you feel. But just think about this. You know, people are preparing awesome meals. You know, they're not just the day of preparation is the time invested into it. They've prepared a list. They've uh, you know, talk to people, they've tried new recipes, they set a beautiful table. Would you show up to a dinner that someone put all that time and energy in with fast food? No, you would not do that, it's so rude. You would never, ever, ever do that. So I'm saying let's not do fast food relating during the holidays, let's not get into debating and just delivering these sound bites to each other about how we feel about things. Let's actually ask each other questions and really try to connect. That's my wish for everybody for the holiday. And I have two requests kind of connected to that. Um, you know, the other things we can do always, let's try to hug each other longer. Remember that great show we did with Steve and we learned about the benefits of a long hug? Hug each other, compliment each other. And, and when you sit around that table to eat, share what you're grateful for and really connect with people. So I have two requests. Um, we just added this awesome resource section to the website and it has tons of cool ideas, like gift ideas for entrepreneurs, uh, foodies, pet lovers, fashionistas, and what this is, is these are affiliates and sponsors to the show, so they help us be able to do what we do. So if you click through some of these cool things, it supports us. So please check that out. We'll share in the comments. Uh, it's, it's just stephaniemichelle.com forward slash resources. Please check it out. Get some ideas. Click through to those things. It helps us. If, you, if you're watching, I think you want to help us and help us do this again. So please uh, do that. And my last request is Giving Tuesday is next Tuesday. You know my favorite nonprofit is the Relational Center. Half the guests that are on the show come through connections and people that I've met through the Relational Center. This is a place that is actually doing the work to help us relate and connect and find our groups of people, like really understand how important interdependence is and just totally blow the myth away that independence is not really a thing. Like we need each other, we need connections. It's, a, it's essential to our well-being. So I'm encouraging you to consider donating to the Relational Center for your Giving Tuesday efforts. Um, there is a link on my homepage. Anybody that does, that does a hundred donation or more will receive one of my Relator bracelets that has the press penny that says Relator. Um, I will personally string it for you and you can tell me even what your wrist size is so you can request exactly what, uh, what size it should be. So if you do that, I would really appreciate it. I'm gonna keep asking. This is a very, very important organization to me and they're doing amazing work, uh, especially in the Los Angeles community. And they also chain institutions and, and companies how they can do better to um, really relate with their employees and customers. So 
it's a super important organization. I encourage you to click through and donate to them. And now, you know, as we think about, uh, you know, some people are kind of sweating getting together with family members and if they're going to be able to have conversations with them and, you know, do they take political t t subjects off, off, the top, off the table altogether. Like, so we're challenged to even just talk to our friends and family. Imagine what all of this, all of the stuff that we're dealing with in the media and these just issues and in learning, like we're learning things and we're having different perspectives, but just imagine how difficult that would be in just meeting someone new and dating. And you know, that's not the only contributor to what we're gonna be talking about today, but there is challenges for young folks that are trying to date. And there is a lean towards just hooking up and not really communicating and not really um, appreciating the value of relationships. And so uh, we're gonna be talking about that today. And I'm sitting with someone that wrote the book on it, did a lot of research and, and dove in and, and talked to college students and, and we're very lucky to have her today. So Lisa Wade is here with us today. She is, the, is a professor at Occidental College in Los Angeles. She earned her MA at, uh, in human sexuality from New York University and her MS and PhD in sociology from the University of Wisconsin. Madison. She is the author of over a dozen research articles, the co-editor of Assigned Life with Gender, author of American Hookup, The, the New Culture of Sex on Campus, and co-author of Gender, Ideas, Interactions, and Institutions. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. I, I, is it weird to hear your bio sometimes? Yeah, all yeah. the time. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, oh, I did all that. <laughs> I got it. yeah. It's a lot, and especially writing here. That's, I mean, you've, you've dove in to some pretty big research topics. Oh, thank you. Well, I really love writing. So yeah. It's easy. It's good. Well, so I always ask, Lisa, anybody that sits in the chair, like I get to do this like rant of what's on my mind at the beginning and I want to give you a chance to do that too. So the question that um, I like to ask is, is there anything that's pulling your attention or that has your attention right now before we get into today's topic? Oh, I mean, I, I think that you're absolutely right that a lot of our emotional attention is, is pulled up into these macro level mm -hmm. problems and, and for really, really good reasons. Yeah. And it's so, for me, I, I see the connections between the, the problems at the macro level and the problems at the micro level. Uh, it, maybe because I'm, I'm trained as a sociologist and that's kind of like what I'm taught to do. Mm -hmm. So even, you know, with the book about, is about hookup culture in college campuses and like, what does that have to do with? With, with anything, but right. it, it ended up being called American Hookup in part because all the problems that we see in that microcosm are, this, are American problems, big American problems. And so it's more of like a lens mm -hmm. than some sort of like side, side set of things that are going on. Right. Uh, so I, I, I absolutely feel that, that real pull from the, the, the micro interactions to this, these big macro issues. Yeah, I 100% I agree with yeah. that. Yeah, I think there's, there's major connections. Well, so at first, so if this is a new term for people, if they're like hookup culture and why yeah. should I care, I'm not in college, like what, what's your best definition for hookup culture? Yeah. What, is it, what is it all about? Okay, so I would say a hookup, a hookup to start uh -huh. is a sexual interaction that has no intention for any sort of future anything. So n no romantic intention, but also no, no guarantee that there'll be any more so sexual interaction. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a short term, um, we used to call them a one night stand, but it, it could have a various amount of sexual activity, sometimes quite little, sometimes quite a lot. Yeah. But the whole, the whole point of it is that you're not doing it for any future it's intention. A transaction. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then, you, so you can think there's that behavior, mm -hmm. which has been going on for as long as there has been humans. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the script, so there's like a, a script for how to do that, um, that I think is widespread in American culture. I think we see that all over the place, and um, often it gets blamed on things like like hookup apps, right? Mm -hmm. we, we understand that there's a script embedded in that that facilitates these sort of short-term right. encounters. A hookup culture is a place where the behavior and the script is considered um, the proper way to interact and maybe even the only way to interact. So what's new about um, college campuses is that whereas hooking up was always something students felt they could do, mm -hmm. now it's something they feel that they should do. So it's a dominant idea, it's a dominant sort of interaction, 
And it also has become institutionalized like in the, in the higher education. Mm -hmm. So there's a rhythm and an architecture to hooking up. Students know when to go and where to go and, and who's going to be there. Mm -hmm. And so it's become a, a really sort of part of what it means to be in college today. I have so many questions or thoughts on this. So like part of me says, OK, like in your, when you're in your 20s or in your college, you should be curious about everything, right? Like mm -hmm. this is the time to really establish uh, your values and beliefs, and it's okay to, 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 it's not okay, it should be the time that you're doing this, right? But if this is so strong it, that it's like, this is the thing, like this is what you have to participate in as a college student, and you don't feel connected to it, what happens to somebody that, like, that this is not something that they want to do? Like, what happens to, if, if you don't participate in hookup culture in college, what, what does that feel like or look like? Yeah, so, and by the way, this is one thing I try to I try to articulate in the book is that the problem on college camps, there is a problem on college campuses, mm -hmm. but it's not the hooking up. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that you have to do it. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah, yeah. and also, um, it's it's this no it's the way they're doing it. Yeah. So I can imagine a hookup, many different kinds of hookup cultures, mm -hmm. some of which are healthier than others, mm -hmm. and ours, we can talk, is particularly unhealthy. But, um, but yeah, so what happens to the students that don't? A lot of students don't hook up. About a third of students from several different studies have shown that they will never hook up a single time in college, according to their own reports. And those students often feel very isolated from their peers, uh, like they're not doing college right, that there's something wrong with them because they don't feel well suited to these casual sexual mm -hmm. encounters. So for them, there's a lot of, a lot of loneliness. Mm -hmm. um, and that Came, came across, the, the data I collected for this book was mm -hmm. diaries, and it came across just so clear, this, this real sense of loneliness and like being out of place and not being able to, to really bond with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is particularly in first year of college. Yeah. Uh, so, and they also don't get into relationships because hookup culture has so, has so captured sexual interaction in college that most relationships um, only evolve out of a series of hookups that are, where both students are pretending like they're not interested in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So even though most students do get into relationships, they do it through a series of hookups. And the students that opt out of hookups, they don't hook up, but they also don't get into relationships. So it's almost like I'm almost hearing like a theme of bullying. Like if you don't do it this way, if you don't participate this way, then you don't get to participate or, or you know, you're, you're not a part of this culture, you're not a part of, your, you're not participating in college the way everybody else is. Like, there's, is it, is it bullying or is it shaming? Like, what? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that it was, like, you know, the traditional peer pressure. Mm -hmm. I, I, w I wouldn't say it's so much mm -hmm. that. I think students think that students who don't want to hook up are kind of adorable, mm -hmm. like old-fashioned yeah. and like sweet. Um, and I, I, so I don't think it's so, I think there's probably some of that, but it's, it's not so much like interpersonal peer pressure, but it's the, it's the power of the, of the context. The situation is so powerful um, that students actually feel bullied by the situation. Mm -hmm. So they'll talk about how, you know, they'll go to a party where there's drinking and a lot of people are going to be hooking up and they feel like in that situation, if they're not doing that, then there's something wrong with so their choices. So it's not the like it's not one on one. A person's going, you know, you were, you're going to have to do this. It's more the expectation of the culture. Like there's just tremendous pressure there. Yeah. That, yeah. That th this thing is going to happen tonight. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And this is just a very basic sociological observation, yeah. right? So we behave differently when we're in a police station than we do when sure. we're at Thanksgiving, than we do when we're in a classroom or, or at a club. Yeah. We all have, we all understand that different contexts demand different kinds of behaviors. Yeah. And so it's, it's sim simply it like that. Call it, so it's like pop culture. It's like it's cool. That's the trend. So it's, you, you, you know, as you're, you're wanting to be perceived as cool and like everybody else. And so there, that, that's the lean towards like, hey, this is what everybody's doing. It's not you're personally pressuring me, but it's more this big thing that's been accepted. Is that? Yeah, there's a um, a great term. Uh, a sociologist named Thomas Vanderven. Mm -hmm. He studied drinking in, in on college campuses, and he called it drunk world. Mm -hmm. He said when drunk world when when drunk world has descended upon a party, mm -hmm. all there's a whole new set of rules for how to interact. And one of the things you don't want to be in drunk world is uh, the sober person. Because yeah. the sober person is doing it wrong. And the sober person is ruining it for everyone else. The sober person is, is the party pooper in the context. 
And so there's just, you know, the, the, that's how you're supposed to be when you're there. Yeah. yeah. So hence the isolation, because if you know that that pressure is about to come to you and you don't want to drink or you don't want to, you know, hook up that night, you're just yeah. not feeling it for whatever reason, um, then you're probably removing yourself from that situation right. pretty pretty fast. Right. And then, then those people that aren't participating tend to take up a lot less space on campus. They're, they're, they're quieter. They're more likely to be inside their mm -hmm. dorm rooms. And so they don't necessarily even know each other is there because mm -hmm. the party years take up so much. They're so much louder and they're so much more psychically like sort of present. Yeah. yeah. Well, what role does communication have in all this? I've heard that part of this is just fear of communication. We're not in, um, and we need to probably talk about genders in this because this will be really broad, but people are not um, comfortable with saying, this is what I'd like. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what does that look like? Just how are people, how are college, how are college students communicating or not communicating? Yeah. Well, so I do, I do often get asked, how do we fix this problem? Yeah. And we could talk about the cute problems, but uh, there's two, I think there's at least two really big pieces to fixing the problem. Mm -hmm. And one is, the, is a power problem. So the students on campus that like hookup culture the most tend to have the most power over their peers, and that is power that is given to them partly by the institution. Uh, and so we need to even the playing field for everybody, and that's one of the big pieces Can to fixing it. Can you give an example it. of that? Like what, what's maybe the archetype of this, per, this student? Sure. Yeah. So um, on many college campuses, the, if, if you, arrive on, you arrive as a first-year college student, you're 18 years old, um, the drinking age was raised to 21 in 1987, all states. Uh, you have internalized the idea that there's a particular way that college students are supposed to party. Mm -hmm. This like classic like red cup, Animal you know. Animal House, yes. like, all the movies we've seen. Yeah. Animal House made a huge, Im huge impression on American culture in terms of thinking about college. So this notion of how you're supposed to party, you can't, but you're 18, so you can't party in your dorms like that. You can pre-party, but you can't really. Mm -hmm. like, College partying is supposed to be just like a bit reckless, you know, like yeah. you're supposed to be um, partying just to the point of perilousness. So, <laughs> so you can't really do that in your dorms because they police the dorms mm -hmm. in most campuses. Um, sororities aren't allowed to throw parties with alcohol for the most part. Um, you are, you're a first year college student, so you don't know a lot of people who are living in apartments, upperclassmen. So uh, there's a really, on many college campuses, only one place to go to party the way you think a college student should, mm -hmm. and that's going to be a fraternity house. And the fraternities that tend to have houses are the ones that are old line fraternities with long American history. Wait, but back up. So sororities, can, for the most part, cannot serve alcohol, but you're telling me that fraternities can? On most college campuses, Whoa. yes. Yeah. Yep. Whoa. So there's a there's a way in which a particular slice of college students who are um, going to be disproportionately white, male, ostensibly heterosexual, and wealthy, have the one place they control the one place where college students can party, and so we basically are kind of like feeding all of our frosh, our first year students into this one space, and then those guys get to decide what parties look like. And those are the guys that tend to like hookup culture the most. Yeah. So disproportionately, all of those things, being white, being male, being heterosexual, um, being wealthy, all those things correlate with more interest in hooking up. So there's a power difference. Yeah. And, and, col and, and colleges and universities are facilitating this, right? And, and so, are the, so are the police, for example. The police are going to bust, you know, um, house parties where they're serving minors, or, you know, the, you, clubs that are serving minors. But we sort of turn a blind eye and let this one slice of, um, that of people. Is, I'm just shocked right now. Yeah. Like almost speechless because I can see as you were saying this every like what what this is setting for different types of people like what this environment is doing to you know if you're um, non-binary if you're trans if you're you know I, and just and when I, I mean I just like yeah. like instantly saw this and that is in, in yeah. not a good way. Um, and so it, have, is there any studies that like any colleges have started to look at this and not let alcohol be served in fraternity? I mean, yeah, some, yeah. some are trying to do that, uh -huh. trying to even the playing field by saying that fraternities can't serve alcohol. Or if they do, it has to be like with a licensed bartender, caterer mm -hmm. type person or at another, mm -hmm. at another location they rent out. Um, some places are 
a few places are trying to gender integrate their fraternities mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that men can't dominate these spaces. Mm -hmm. um, Harvard is doing that right now with their finals clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other places that are just trying to bring, like, get rid of Greek life altogether because, I mean, it's funny because um, when Greek life began in the mid, er, early to mid 1800s, college presidents were absolutely mortified. Mm -hmm. They called it un-American, that mm -hmm. people would segregate themselves and try to, you know, have these elite clubs. Mm -hmm. and so, um, so that some people, some institutions are, are phasing out Greek life. Uh, but for the most part, there's been, there's been very little sort of leadership around this mm -hmm. from the administrators of higher education. And, um, and, and very little experimentation or brainstorming about what to do about it. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of hand-wringing. There's a lot of, oh, what could we possibly do? Um, there's nothing we could do. But I think, I think that there's a real lack of like, political but sort of leadership to, to, to think about it. Because another option would be to try to empower all the other students. Instead of disempower that one slice, yeah. try to empower. Um, but we're really at the very beginning of thinking this through. Yeah, so I, can, I just can imagine. So if your whole social life is is uh, hanging on uh, you going into a fraternity and acting a certain way, and that's not the way that you want to act, and they can decide, mm -hmm. they can decide that hey, you, you're not fun. You're not a fun girl. You're not drinking. You're not flirting. You're not wearing you know wearing whatever. Like yeah. and then you're out. Wow, just, yeah. I'm really shocked right now. I mean, yeah. like in Harbor, I, I didn't experience college this way, so I didn't experience um, the Greek system. But yeah, I'm, I, I'm almost speechless, which doesn't happen very often because I did not uh, really think about it in this yeah. way. So, um, well, let's talk about expectations and assumptions around. Well, I can also answer the relating yeah. question. Yeah, <laughs> that was yeah. the part two yeah. of what needed to happen. Yeah, which is that most young students. Uh, and my, the students in my book were all mm -hmm. first-year students, mm -hmm. um, are absolutely terrified to say what they really want, to te tell each other yeah. what they really desire. Yeah. Um, they are all, I mean, well, we should be kind to them because remember, 50% of college freshmen who are 18 mm -hmm. are virgins when they start college. Mm -hmm. A lot of the students in my book, well, a handful, had never even had been kissed. Mm -hmm. So they're really new to this thing. It, and they're trying so hard to not do it wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, being wrong in America is already considered such a bad thing. But like being wrong about sex is really, yeah. nobody wants that. And so they're trying to do it right and acquire some skills and to try to also be reflective about what the culture that they're in. It's a lot to ask. Yeah, um, are there any studies about uh, are people waiting, or are young people waiting longer to have that first kiss? Is it like, do we know that that's not happening in high school anymore? We know that um, that this generation that's in high school and college right now is acquiring fewer sexual partners, and they're acquiring them later than at least the three generations before. Mm -hmm. There's a real decline in in how many um, sexual encounters and, and the types of sexual encounters that people are having, and I I think there's lots of theories for why, but I think one of them might be. If, if, the, if the barrier to getting any sexual experience is being able to tolerate casualness, that's just a lot to ask from someone who has no experience. Yeah. And it's just beginning. And so in that case, some students say, a lot, well, quite a lot of students say, I would rather have no sex at all than have mm -hmm. the kind of sex that's available to me. That, so there's a big disconnect between what is perceived as right and right for you. Like this language of right for me, you know, knowing me, uh, like, uh, uh, knowing what my values are, like there's, yeah. there's just no conversation about that. That's what I'm feeling. There's a real sense that being able to be casual about sex is what it, is, is what it looks like when you're comfortable with yourself mm. and, and don't have any hang-ups. And this comes, this I think comes directly out of the feminist movement and the sexual revolution of the 70s. Uh, and we <laughs> like, yeah, to be liberated, you have to be yes. But there's not we're not showing all sides of it. I mean, to be liberated is being respectful to your body and not making choices that are not well thought out. I mean, there's so many different perspectives right. on that. Right. So, you know, you'd think that to be liberated would be to be able to choose to do whatever you want for whatever reason with whoever you want, um, however you want, mm -hmm. without any kind of. Uh, outside pressures as long as everything's consensual and safe. Mm -hmm. um, but instead, in general, what we've gotten is this notion that to be liberated, women need to do what men do. Mm. 
or be, be in, at least in some ways, the ways men are, to be ambitious, to be competitive, to go into male-dominated occupations mm -hmm. um, and, and leisure activities. And so we teach our daughters from the time they're real little that, like, it's fine to be girly, you're a girl, but when you do things that are boyish, somehow that's a little bit cooler or more badass or more liberated. I mean, think about how we... Um, you know, it's cute if they play with Barbies, that's mm -hmm. fine, but if they play with trucks and, or dinosaurs, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, look at my little daughter. And if she wants to major in education when she goes to school, like, that's, she's a good person, we're very proud of her, but if she wants to major in chemistry or computer science, we're like, wow, my yeah. daughter is like that kind of daughter. Um, you know, we support her if she wants to be a cheerleader, but we brag about her if she goes into sports. So they learn this lesson mm -hmm. over and over again. It's okay to be girly, but something is so somehow I'm somehow better mm -hmm. if I'm just a little bit boyish. And they just apply that logic to sex. It's okay to be emotional about sex, to want emotions to be a part of that, but it's somehow better and perhaps even what liberation looks like to be able to just go into it with no emotions. So in fact, of course, the students have all kinds of different desires mm -hmm. and feelings and needs, um, but this, this idea has become, is so convincing, this idea that to be liberated is to be able to be casual about sex is so convincing that particularly when they're just new um, to this situation, it's, it's terrifying for them to actually admit what they really want. Yeah. I, what's coming up for me, I mean, even at 45, my experiences of living in Los Angeles, um, there was a time in my life where, you know, partying and all that stuff was still fun, but th then I started to kind of go in a different direction, right? And I still have friends my age that are doing those things, that, that are definitely hook up, in the hookup culture, like partying to 4 a.m. and all this. And, and I can remember in some of these, like, I would just say transitions of like, you know, I'm going to pick this over that, that I would get shame for not doing, just staying on the party scene. And I'm just like, well, wait a second. Am I only open-minded if I'm open-minded to your stuff? Yeah. Because I'm exploring other things and wouldn't it make sense or wouldn't it be fair even if you were open-minded to see that, you know, there are other things in life. Like even, so even, I just can't even imagine being, a, being in college or even in high school right now and having this be a more um, difficult, uh, you know, a difficult, what do we want to call it, a crisis or, um, you know, thing to be dealing with, because it's still present in my adult life. Yeah. I think that the script, the hookup script, has escaped the hookup culture. Like, yeah. the script is now everywhere. Yeah. And I, and I think that those of us that aren't in hookup cultures, and you can think about certain, like, Gay men in the 70s invented the hookup culture, yeah. right? They invented these gay enclaves yeah. where there was a lot of that. Um, and you can imagine there are there, that there are other cult, hookup cultures around, like certain clubs and bars or like yeah. certain vacation spots. But even outside of those spaces where like, geographically hooking up is dominant, oh, I think the script is everywhere. And that people now, like, oh, there's like these two scripts, the dating script and the hookup script side by side. Yeah. And it's really hard to tell what script someone else is using. I, this is this, so. I, this this is why I'm not on online dating because yeah. every. So I've said this so many times. It's like the wild wild west. There's no there are no rules that everybody's applying yeah. uh, playing by, and so you can yep. read every dating coach. Blah blah blah. You know, and I, yep. I think actually some of that stuff makes us sick. You know, these like fast food content top ten things that you can yeah. do on your. But anyhow, but so you can apply a lot of your own. Um, values and beliefs and boundaries on and on your side mm -hmm. in that dating situation but that doesn't mean that you're dealing with somebody that has the same stuff and so yeah. you either need to be flexible and kind of feel out the situation or um, go along with something that you really didn't really want to go along with but you're you're right like the dating script and the hookup script is right they're side by side you can't tell them apart you don't know which one someone's playing yeah and um you know so i'm not on them because i find them to be it's, 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 uh, for me, it's just, it's like, it's, it's a waste, of, well, it's a waste of time, but it also is, um, it hurts my soul, like, that people are communicating and relating this way, like, you know, sending me a dick pic, I don't know you, like, just not understanding that I'm a real person with a heart and mind on the other side of that, and, like, that's inappropriate, mm -hmm. and, like, not funny, mm -hmm. like, I don't know you, yeah. <laughs> like, um, so, yeah, so I just, it's, it is everywhere, and I think this is why we should care about it. And it also, I think, you know, as we are having these experiences where they're not very favorable with like, like deep 
human interactions, like it flows into everything else. We just start to not, you know, ex believe that there's anything other than that. You know, and we're not trying to connect with friends and family when we get together. Like we're not finding that nourishment and relational stuff. Yeah. Because this is like, well, this is what I'm supposed to accept this social norm. It's okay. I mean, I think we're all being taught to be really instrumental towards everything in our lives. Mm -hmm. Especially young people today are growing up with so much pressure to like develop them, their own human capital so that they'll be competitive in this world where the middle class is shrinking and it's harder and harder to be okay. So they're getting taught to orient towards everything in this instrumental way. Like, you know, will these classes get me into college as opposed to I want to take these classes? Or, you know, will this volunteer experience help look, look good on my, on my college applications mm -hmm. or my resume, right? As opposed to I really want to help people. Mm -hmm. And I think that we keep teaching them these instrumental relationships or instrumental way of relating, mm -hmm. and then they just apply that to human beings as well. I mean, my students have this really clear sense that, like, there is a kind of relationship that is loving, mm -hmm. and that is a monogamous, committed, sexual relationship um, that that is publicly acknowledged, you know, like a, a, when you're a couple, mm -hmm. but that every other kind of relationship that's not that um, doesn't have to have that benevolence in it. Mm -hmm. So they saw hookups as the opposite of relationships. If relationships were caring and benevolent and loving um, and cooperative and like win-win mutual, then hookups were the opposite of that. They were instrumental, they were exploitative, they were win-lose, they were competitive, and so, and they thought that was perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I try to explain to them is like, that's a relationship too. Yeah. It might be very short-lived, but like, it's still another human being that you are relating to for however short a period, and it too can have care and benevolence in it. it we, we don't have to con contain that only in this one kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and this idea of being both caring and casual at the same time blows their minds. <laughs> Didn't, wasn't one of the, st the statistics or one of the things that you found in your study is um, people are not even expecting kindness in their sexual encounters through, s yeah, can you talk about that? Well, like, yeah, yeah, because kindness is for relationships mm -hmm. where there's care and benevolence. And if it's a hookup, y you, are not, you are not supposed to care for the other person. Because um, it's supposed to be merely sexual. It's like that you're cooler by being like, yeah. oh, yeah. whatever. Oh, yeah. The worst thing you can get called on college campuses today, it isn't slut. It isn't even prude, although that's a big one. It's desperate. Ugh. Nobody or wants... like needy, mm. emotional. Yeah, yeah, the new one is thirsty. Thirsty, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's, you know, nobody wants to seem like they like anyone else too much. And so everyone's pretending like they don't care. And so that's how hookup cultures are supposed to be. So if you're supposed to act like you don't really care, then when someone treats you in a cruel or callous way, you th that's totally on script. That's, yeah. that's within the bounds of the rules. And you have no justification to be upset about that. And if it hurts your feelings, then it's your fault for having feelings to begin with. Yeah. So how do they feel about love? Like <laughs> your face just said everything. Like, they, right. they want it. Yeah. I mean, so. Well, the funny part is that three quarters of college students would really like more opportunities to form meaningful romantic connections. Mm -hmm. And men, a few more percentage points more so than women. Really? Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, they all crave it. And they, they, are, they do feel lonely. Hookups, don't, hookups do get feed, feed many things for them, but they don't really feed their sense of connection. And so... Um, so many of them really would love to have love, but uh, they don't have a lot of optimism that that's going to be possible for them. Mm -hmm. Well, and it doesn't seem like it could be if you're practicing things that are counter to that achievement. Like yeah. you're actually in a practice. Like you're just like we would exercise, you know, to for um, you know to feel physically fit or to have more energy. Like you're doing the exact opposite thing that would help you with that achievement. Yep, and, and because most romantic relationships do come out of a series of hookups where everyone's pretending not to like each other, then whether you're looking for a rom that, relationship... It's like a happens, happen re happenstance relationship or something. Like oh, just hap what is it? it? You know, I know what you're getting at, but yeah, I can't yeah. recall. Um, but everyone, whether they're looking for a relationship or not, is pretending like they're not. So it looks like nobody wants one. So the students they, themselves, they don't know that most people around them would like a relationship. So, uh, so how, and, and we're, we, 
you've done research and you had people share journals. So this, is, so when we say they, this is who we're talking about. So we're not talking about everybody, but this is hard research or um, the group of people. Um, what are the, what are their thoughts about um, authenticity and being honest? Like, do, are these things that people are talking about? Yeah, it's funny because we're such a hyper individualistic yeah. society that values individuality and authenticity, uh, authenticity so much. Uh, but I, generally the way in which I think authenticity gets sold to us mm -hmm. is literally it gets sold to us in, in here's what you need to buy to be authentic. If you pay attention, you'll notice there's a lot of marketing like, oh, yeah. be you, buy, buy Diet Coke, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh <-huh. laughs> so there's a, a lot of way in which individuality gets framed for us as the, the purchases we make, the haircuts we get, the clothes we buy, the music we listen to. Mm -hmm. And it gets divorced from anything that can't be commodified. Mm -hmm. And so I think students are still struggling with that. I think we all are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, uh, so are there any things that are happening on college campuses that are helping students be equipped for relationships? Well, <laughs> thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, I feel like every generation like gifts the next generation, um, like every, every generation fix a bun bunch of problems that like creates a whole bunch of problems for the next generation. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's not like things are uniquely terrible for yeah. them. It's just that th this is their unique problem that we have gifted them with trying to solve. Um, and so in some ways what's happening on college campuses is really good. Like there's a lot less guilt about, about sexual activity. Mm -hmm. um, for, um, for women, there is a lot less judgment for women's sexual behavior. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot more openness to different ways of expressing gender and sexual orientations, mm -hmm. a lot more. Um, there's a lot more ideas that sexuality is supposed to be something that is healthy and normal. Um, there's a lot more conversation about consent. So like a lot of things are much better. And in some ways, um, in some ways sex is a lot freer the problem that remains are, isn't problems of freedom, it's problems of equality. Mm. So there's a difference between freedom and equality, and we seem to have gone a, quite a few ways towards freedom, but we're way behind on equality. So, um, and, the, and the sexual activity that students are having, even when it's not particularly pleasurable in the moment, mm -hmm. um, often does a lot to give them confidence, helps them build skills, they bond with their friends over it. Uh, so there, are, there is a lot of positive things coming out mm -hmm. of um, of that activity. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited, honestly, to see what college students do with, with the, the opportunity to solve this problem. Yeah. Because I know maybe better than anyone how really, really smart and insightful and creative uh, these young people are. Mm -hmm. And so I really do have a lot of faith that they can figure it out. And Remember that my book is based on first year students mm -hmm. and they do learn a lot in that year. Mm -hmm. And then they go on to continue to learn as they grow up. Do you, do you think, I'm gonna back up even further because you are a professor and you can speak on this. Do you think that there are opportunities in how we're teaching students, like how we're, our relationship with just learning in general could help in terms of allowing students to learn better or learn, um, um, understand that there's not a, uh, this and that, right and wrong, you know, part of the culture, not part of the culture. Do you, you see where I'm going? Do you think there's an opportunity to teach learning in a different way? Or yeah, I, th yeah. <laughs> I think so. I, um, you do, there's this idea of the growth mindset yeah. that we're not, we don't just get born with things we're going to be good or bad at, but mm -hmm. that we can become better at just about anything we try to become better at. Mm -hmm. uh, and I. I, I notice that a lot of students come into college without that, mm -hmm. and so they'll come and say, "Oh, I'm bad at math." I'm like you're 18. Yeah, you're not bad at you're not. Stop <laughs> telling yourself <laughs> yeah. that story. That's, yeah. a, that's a silly label. Like, yeah. why, why are you doing this? Yeah. Um, and and I think too, like, around sexuality, well, and also so there's the there's the, the lack of the growth mindset and this this instrumental achievement oriented paradigm mm -hmm. where everything's about what grade did you get and how, you know how are you building. And so what's missing in this, but in both sexuality and in their approach to life in general, is this sense of pure discovery or experience for experience's yeah. sake. And, and that's definitely and, true. And being curious, just like playing with their own curiosity. Yeah. Because you know? it's like, you're telling me to do this, but I want to be curious about something. Can I? 
Yeah. So hookup culture, it sounds like it's like this free for all, mm -hmm. but it's actually a very rigid set of rules by which everyone is acquiring sexual experience. It's not dis it's not discovery or exploratory or curiosity based yeah. at all. Um, unless well, I'm sure stuff, I'm sure stuff like that happens, but like the, the rules are very strict. Um, and then, but the, and then they have the same orientation towards the classes. And you know, I have to get this kind of grade and take these kind of classes to get into med school and so on and so forth. Yeah, I I taught a digital marketing ca class for a couple of years at, at General Assembly, and it was young college students or you know people in their in, uh, in their twenties. Um, and my experience was like, so many students wanted this absolute answer and in yeah. marketing there are very little absolute yeah. answers it's a constant like learning growing and I just kept wondering like where is that coming from yeah. you know and it was so it w and, and many of um, many stories like you just said um, about I'm bad at math or I, I don't learn this I, I, I'm a terrible learner I've been told that I'm a terrible student yeah. you know I'll, like no 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 yeah. no like that that right there is hurting you but like yeah so I, I wonder a lot if, if there's a better way to kind of teach people um, and I think it's almost you know, one of the bigger issues that we're experiencing in this country, I don't think the divide is city people and country people. I think the divide is like our relationship with learning. Mm -hmm. You know, that um, some of us do accept that like, I'm a work in progress at all times and uh, and new information is coming at me and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna consider some of that. And then there's some people that are like, nope, I, there's no imp new information that I need. I'm good, mm -hmm. I'm good where we are. and I. There, that's a strange thing. Like I would, lo I'd love to have people like you that know how to research, dive into like what what causes us to have such a uh, strange relationship with learning in general. Yeah. Um, that we're not being more of an advocate for our own learning experiences and our own curiosity. Yeah. Uh, you know, as someone who has spent a lot of time writing on the internet, um, <laughs> I, I've noticed that one of the common things that will happen is if I say something that's, sometimes I say things that are wrong, yeah. and sometimes I think, say things that are bad, because yeah. you just are gonna, yeah. right? and, um, and, or sometimes I don't, but, it, but in any case, someone will go into the comment threads and they'll say something to the effect of like, you said something wrong or bad, or what I think is wrong or bad, and therefore, you should you should never speak again. Right. Like you should just shut this blog down right, right, and bear, right. dig a hole and go in it. And you should be so mortified that you never <laughs> speak publicly again. And there is this really it's a very common theme that like like the, that they assume I should feel some level of mortification that is 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 overwhelming. And I so just the I, we're just so scared of being wrong in public. Yeah. I always say best place to be wrong is in public yeah because you get corrected yeah and then you know better I I agree as a marketer so I've spent most of my my um, career as an ad agencies or marketing uh, and when all the Yelps and the and you know social media came about and people were so worried um, about their reputation yeah. and then you had like new marketing firms coming up reputation management and like how to shut down like the negative comments I'm like no 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 that is the biggest opportunity because yeah. the way you respond to it um, other people will see it and then they'll decide you know if they can form a relationship with you and it's usually they'll form a longer one and, and if you correct it the problem in a certain way or acknowledge it um, then that person has now turned into like a lifetime customer yeah. so it's a total opportunity yeah. I agree with you if it happens yeah. in public because you'll feel the sting a little bit more yeah and um, if you like learning you'll go this is awesome yeah. you know I didn't know I had a little blind spot or mm -hmm. a big blind spot you know I had a blind spot and now I've learned and, and thank you but you're right there is a lot of oh that's shame or people um, really um, saying harmful things to someone when that happens and and yet you said a hundred other great things <laughs> you know you said this one bad thing yeah. and they're gonna hold you against that and like yeah, there's something there. There's something yeah. there that, that we could look at each other and be more kind um, around. We're all, nobody's perfect. We're all learning at all times, mm -hmm. um, whether we choose to or not, you know, <laughs> it's still there, yeah. unless it's right in front of you. Um, so, you know, this is an easy question to ask. I mean, so there's definitely some reverse double standards that are happening in the hookup culture. Am I right or like? I mean, what do you mean by that? I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I, yeah, that is. I mean, well, I, I well, because when I see this very one-sided male dominant heterosexual um, young college kids that are like really dictating everything, um, if 
if a woman tried to do that, if uh, uh, if a person of the LGBTQ community tried to do that, yeah. I mean, how would that work? Like, if, if if the standards are like this is what it is, and somebody else tries to like, well, no, it's really not. Like, what happens? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I would love to see that play out. Yeah. Like, remember when I talked about empowering people around? Mm -hmm. Like, I would love to see campuses make a whole bunch of party spaces available mm -hmm. to um, all kinds of different interest groups on campus mm -hmm. to see what kind of parties they want to throw mm -hmm. um, and, and, and let like parties diversify on yeah. campus. And so whether it's the chess club or you know the theater kids or the Black Student Association, like what kind of parties could, might they want to, to I think I think that that we really don't know right now because yeah. we just don't have a lot of examples of of different kinds of groups getting the power to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, well, and they may try. What it seems like where they try to do it, if you're not feeling, you know, the general culture of your campus, then you might try to do this online or try to. Yep. you know find people that are like well I'm feeling this like where are my people I gotta find my yeah. people that so, so people do go off campus so mm -hmm. that's why Grindr arrives on college campuses mm -hmm. so much earlier than Tinder is because gay men feel like they don't really have a lot of opportunities and so they start going off campus there's also some evidence that a lot of Asian students and particularly Asian men mm -hmm. don't feel welcome at those parties and so they go off they, they, they tend to go off to off-campus parties. Sometimes they go to raves and things like that. Mm -hmm. So there are people that are kind of fleeing the campus culture because it doesn't work for them. Yeah. Um, are the, it, it, does STDs come up in this equation? Oh, like, that's so interesting. Yeah, like what, do they have a fear of, of what's safe sex look like? Do they have a fear of getting an STD? What, what's, what's going on there? So, the safe sex behavior of college students today is not as good as it was mm -hmm. for a Generation X. Um, and the, the neuroscientists find that young people, well, probably all of us, mm -hmm. um, tend to make a judgment within milliseconds of whether or not the person they are sitting across from is someone they need to protect themselves from. Okay. And so a lot of college students feel like they're in an in-group, like they're all together, they're all similar, and there isn't a lot of worry. There's a lot more worry about pregnancy, mm -hmm. but if, um, if a young woman is on the pill or has an IUD or some other kind of um, non-barrier type method, then condom use is more common in a first-time sexual encounter with someone and then dwindles off pretty quick, especially if you are um, coming from an upper-class background they are the worst condom users. Um, and working class students come in with better condom use practices and then drop them as they get socialized into the upper class lifestyle of higher ed. Um, and, and we're only talking about, we're not talking about oral sex on women at all. Mm -hmm. There's still no, um, essentially no um, safe sex behavior around that. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not good. Um, they, they generally, feel like they're pretty safe, mm. that anything they do get is easily handled, and they have a lot of misconceptions about uh, what is, what is, like, what testing does for them. So for example, I was at a campus, I won't name them, <laughs> the, the other day, where they had free, free STD testing. Mm -hmm. And so students would just go once a month or whatever and get tested, and they felt like everyone, ar every, everyone around them was doing that, so that they, they were safe as a community. Well, what they, they weren't necessarily confirming that their peers were doing that, one. But second, you go in to get an STD test at a typical clinic, you just get a few tests. You don't mm -hmm. get tested for all the, t all, mm -hmm. all the possible things. Mm -hmm. So they had this really like totally warped sense of safety based on this accessibility of testing at their, at their college. And they really did kind of feel like, well, within this bubble, we're, we're safe. Huh. Um, what's, so just with your own students, um, are, what, what issues come up the most around this? Like, what are the things that, re, that come up repeatedly? Yeah. And maybe in, repeatedly, and then I'd also like to hear maybe what personally breaks your heart a little bit, uh, right, that you wish there was a better solution. Uh, well, four things come up okay. repeatedly. One is sexual assault. That comes up a lot. That's a really very serious problem on college campuses. Uh, another is um, unequal pleasure. 
so that men are getting a lot, when they hook up with women, are getting a lot more orgasms than when women hook up with men. Mm -hmm. um, in first time hookups, it's one out of every, women have one for every three men enjoy. Um, there is the experience of bias. Uh, so being um, not traditionally gendered, being trans, being a person of color, being coming out of the working class, being mm -hmm. con somehow conventionally not attractive enough, or too, con too fat, or having a disability, all of these things um, being seen as making you unattractive and undesirable. Mm -hmm. And in a, in, a, in, a, in a little microcosm of culture that values sexual, sexual attractiveness above any kind of relational affinity, mm -hmm. that's really, that can be really very unpleasant to experience. Uh, and, then, um, and then there is the emotional distress of trying to stuff down your feelings and, and, and sort of psych yourself up into doing this casual behavior. Somewhere between, I would say, 15 and 25% of students really, really like hookup culture. Mm -hmm. Like it works for them. Mm -hmm. It's perfect, it's what they want. Mm -hmm. But everyone else is trying to pu push themselves into that box with, mm -hmm. with mixed feelings and mixed emotions. Mm -hmm. So all four of those are the acute problems that we see based on this hookup culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's hard to pick one of those things that is the most upsetting for mm -hmm. me. But I, I do feel like it's this idea that you're not entitled to be treated kindly. Yeah. That I, that I guess for me is particularly hard to see, but also I think contributes to all those other things. Because if you're not supposed to care about the other person, why would you care about their consent or their pleasure? Yeah. And if you're not supposed to pick someone because you like them, then, um, then you pick them based on their social status, and that's going to be related to racism and classism and all those other things. So I feel like, like all four of those problems can be tied to that, that one thing. Yeah. Uh, what, what about mental health on ca campuses? Like, what, uh, is there a stigma for the students to go see a counselor or to talk to somebody? Or um, Talk to me about that. I, I, I don't know if there's a stigma. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that literature, mm -hmm. but man, is it, is, it is a crisis. Yeah. I'll tell you that. Um, at my own institution, mm -hmm. the number of students registered with the Disability Services Center with anxiety or depression doubled in two years recently. And that is a countrywide trend. Yeah, it's yeah. happening everywhere. So 50% of college freshmen now say that they worry they're not emotionally healthy. And so we've seen this really incredible rise in it's just all kinds of distress and also more severe yeah. um, emotional problems. And it, it, people are very, very concerned. Yeah. I mean, yeah. adults, I mean, I think the statistics on adults is like two and three, a two out of three have some sort of social anxiety. And yeah. I don't know how you couldn't, you yeah. know, like with um, the constant, uh, you know, the, co the constant cycle of things that are happening that are not good. Yeah. And and you don't, I don't, I, I wonder about this. I don't even know if our human condition was meant to process this stuff so quickly. So one thing happens, Thousand Oaks shooting, and you're not even done dealing with that. And then there's the fires, yeah. and then there's something else. Yeah. And then, you know, it's just, it's crazy. <laughs> like, I, I, you know, I think, so um, whether or not you, Whatever, wherever you are on the political spectrum, mm -hmm. whether or not you like Trump or not, mm -hmm. his election was such a surprise. You know, it, it surprised everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was, that was a moment where we learned that, like, we think the future is predictable. And it's not. Um, things can happen that we never dreamed mm -hmm. could happen. Some people, like, I, I never in my wildest, happiest dreams imagined Trump and others in my wildest nightmares, right? And, I, and our, stu our college frosh were 14 when Trump started his campaign, mm -hmm. and 16 when he got elected. Mm -hmm. And th they, they lived between 16 and 18 with this, this world that feels so much more unpredictable than ever before, oh. Wh which I think is why they, they do like the rules, right? They, they like the rules of hookup culture because that's predictable. I think they're seeking that. And part of their anxiety is this fear of, of sponta spontaneity and unpredictability. Yeah. So, it, and it's got to feel very strange, like everything that you were told was right, you know, not lying, <laughs> uh, yeah. um, being kind to others, like these things, just basic, you know, our basic compass yeah. of morality, like there, none of that stuff is yes. applicable, yeah. it seems to be, you know, like people are getting away with a lot of bad stuff. And, we, <laughs> and not only getting away with it, but 
rewarded for it. Yeah. We have a name for this in sociology, actually, oh. that comes from like the 1800s. Um, it's called anomie. Uh, anime is a state of normlessness where, where the norms you thought applied suddenly don't. And you, now you don't know what the rules are anymore. And it's the anime is like the, the, the frustration and confusion. And is it a, kind of a, th uh, a known thing about human nature? So instead of, a, so when that happens, instead of going, okay, I need to pull back and figure out what, what's just best for me. Instead, we just kind of go, well, we're all going to die. It's not safe anyway, <laughs> so let's just run towards the fire. Like, it seems like human nature kind of goes the opposite. It's like, yeah, the bomb's going to drop anyway, so I might as well party like it's 1999, <laughs> you know? Like, is that a thing? Do we know that, like, that's a normal, most people kind of lean towards, well, they're doing it, so I'm going to do it. I don't know. I mean, I think that, I think that we are such social creatures that uh, that that we seek to reestablish like connection via shared values and norms, mm -hmm. and so I think when when we experience that that those unsettled moments, um, we there is this real desire to retrench uh, these kinds of rules, and that's why really conservative movements tend to come along at moments where things of change. Right, where there's that, that always that backlash to change, mm -hmm. um, where no, 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 they they're experiencing this sense of anomie, like things aren't supposed to change in this way, and they they retrench. So even when, um, you know, there's this great <laughs> to go totally off. There's this great book about um, what happened when this plane crashed in the 1970s. I think it was 78 mm -hmm. up in the Andes, and people had to survive for a couple months eating only each other, mm -hmm. and the way in which. The cannibalism being a, violating an incredibly strong taboo, but as soon as they decided to do it, the rules that they set up to guide doing it. Mm -hmm. So they set up a whole bunch of rules, like um, who, who's going to get eaten, what kind of body parts should be eaten, how are we going to divide the labor, who gets to eat more or less. And so it was like even in even in moments where the rules have completely dis been destroyed, a, a new set of rules always rises up to well, take their place. But, but what I think is unique about that situation is, so they, this was a group of people, they didn't expect to be in crisis together, and now they're in crisis, so they're, they don't have the same values and beliefs. They're not that little entrenched bubble. But, so they had to like be diplomatic about rules and things to make it work, yeah. right? And that, I love that you brought that example up, <laughs> even though it's kind of weird to be thinking about, <laughs> especially pre-Thanksgiving. But, um, but like there, there's just something, and this is the stuff that keeps me up at night, is like, there's some new something that has to happen where, yeah. yes, it's in our nature to kind of go into our trenches with our bubble and, and, and have our thoughts and feelings validated and what we think we know, but there has to be something that opens us up to like, okay, I'm going to spend some time with these people, different people that are not part of my bubble, and then maybe take some stuff back. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't, you know, it, something's different, I, I mean, it's different for, it feels different for me in my short existence on this planet that um, we need some new rules. Yeah. We really need some new rules. And like the, the biggest concern that I have, and this is me just getting into a real weird conspiracy, is that um, we do have a problem with resources. We are hurting our planet. And there's going to be a time when we're, you know, there, there's too many of us. And, um, and we're going to have a group of people making decisions that are not on our behalf. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that's already happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's in the works. And so this idea of human life not being of value or the most important value and the most shared value that we have concerns me. And so when we do things against each other that, does, that represents us not really valuing our human interaction, like I just get, it just hits me. <laughs> every, yeah. part my, every part of my, every part of who I am, it just, we got to do something about this, yeah. you know, in the context of inno innovation. I mean, think about how um, AI will replace a lot of people working in jobs, and then we've got all those. Well, think about, like, how we, we tend to measure the health of a country by GDP. Mm -hmm. So how much profit. <laughs> yeah. And um, some countries are trying to say maybe there's better measures, like happiness, Yeah. overall happiness. We could live in a globe where the, the, the data that got reported from every country to see the health of that country was how happy mm -hmm. are the people. But happiness is irrelevant to, yeah. to how we judge a country's health. Yeah. And that really tells us something. Yeah, definitely. That is not a good place to end this show. <laughs> 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 but we are getting short on time. Uh, 
So I'm going to switch. Was well, there anything that you do want to say that's kind of more hopeful that your research is telling you? I mean, there are a couple moments in, in what you've shared that I think are helpful. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you want to share? Like, going in that well, direction? I, I, I'll reiterate that I think that the book is, the book lays out, um, it diagnoses the, the trouble on college campuses, but the 101 students that wrote diaries for me are so smart and so insightful and so lovable and funny um, and unique, each one from the next. I think it's really hard to come out of that book feeling pessimistic. Mm -hmm. And I, I really do believe that if we just like level the playing field for them and and allow them to bring into reality the culture the 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 sort of diverse set of cultures, sexual cultures that they would like, mm -hmm. that they would be able to do it. And so I'm, I, and I, and I, I have a lot of faith in them mm -hmm. to push institutions to do that for them. Uh, like I said, I think every generation delivers um, the next generation a new set of problems. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to see how they, how they fix the problems that they're confronting, not to suggest that that from that point forward, there will never be any problems. Yeah. But um, I, I'm a, I do think they have a lot of the tools they need to do the work that they need to do. And we need to do what we need to do, too, by leveling that playing and, field. And we have good examples out there where young students have got raised, oh, you know, raised their voice into amazing. the equation of talk to government and, you know, um, they've petitioned, they've protested. Oh, yeah, from the Never Again movement, yeah. coming out of uh, the, the mass shooting mm -hmm. problem um, to... Um, the, the students that started um, the, the campaign to ha have the Office for Civil Rights mm -hmm. hold colleges responsible for a sexual assault. Uh, young people, especially young people of color, and especially young queer people and queer people of color, are showing up as leaders um, for movements on all kinds of progressive issues all over college campuses. And it's really exciting to see what they're doing. Oh, yeah. It, they're going to they're gonna change the world, too. That's awesome. So that's the note that I wanted <laughs> to end that. OK, so just. So the last thing that we'll do, uh, just because we're short on time now, is I'd love to give you an opportunity to do a heart swell. And what this is, is just a tribute, a shout out to somebody. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer that independence is a myth, that we have people that help us get to where we are. I don't really want to promote interdependence at all times. But yeah. um, So just, do you, does someone come to mind? And it could be a group of people. Well, there are no rules in hearts well. Yeah. Um, does someone come to mind that you'd like to like give a shout out to and say, hey, you mean the world to me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I will. I'll give a heart swell to my my friend whose eulogy I gave this this weekend. Uh, his name was Brett Wheeler, mm -hmm. and he was um, this wonderful human being who um, put helping other people at the forefront of everything he did. He majored in women's studies in, or sorry, minored in women's studies in the early 1990s, wow. and um, did 10 years of rape crisis counseling. He, um, he taught women self-defense. He uh, was teaching human sexuality classes uh, with a distinctly and resolutely feminist point of view. Uh, and he, um, he was getting his PhD in positive psychology when he passed. And uh, he has been a, a, real, a real help to me for a good 15 years. And so uh, I wish we would all like, live up to his example. He was. Um, he was principled to the point of self-righteousness, which made him a little bit of an asshole sometimes. <laughs> but but m may, may we all have that problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I wish that, that, that sounds like a wonderful person. And, the, and you know, this is, this is how we know how beautiful our human condition is, that this person is no longer physical with us, but he has had a great impact on you and I'm sure a lot of other people. Um, so I think it's also a good place to end the show. It's like that, you know, just never, never get discouraged about doing something that feels like every part of you is pulling you to do it because this is the, the this is our human condition. This is how we impact each other with yeah. our best work, our best gift, you know, to the, to the planet at the time that we're here. And I love hearing stuff like that. Yeah. <sighs> so thank you. Um, what did it, <laughs> I mean, we probably could go on for hours. Um, I, Really appreciate you being here today. It's my pleasure. Um, your social profile is up on the screen right now, but Lisa's website is lisa-way.com. We'll share all that in the archives. 
Um, and we had a little scheduling conflict, so I was really grateful that you stepped up to be here, and we're not totally sure who's on the show next <laughs> Tuesday, um, but it will be a good one. But I really appreciate you being here, Lisa. Thank you. Thank um, you. If there's anything, so we always issue a social challenge of the week. I'm trying to think um, what would be something inspired by our, our uh, talk. I mean, do you think that, um, I mean, I hope what this, is, what this conversation did for people is maybe relatives that are getting together, and they do have a young college student and um, you know, a cousin or a niece, a nephew that's coming, and you just really don't know how to relate to them. Um, maybe this gives some context and, 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 and maybe opens the door to ask a question about, like, you know, what are you experiencing? Because I think there's a lot of assumptions when generations get together that, oh, that's you being a girl or you being a boy or you oh, you're just in college or dating, and like really there's a lot more going on yeah. for young people right now. So I'm feeling like maybe the social challenge of the week as we enter into holiday is um, asking a, a someone younger than you, like what are they experiencing right now? Like, are, are, um, and, and, uh, and then be willing to share how that's different than what you experienced at the same age. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Without judgment. With yeah, would definitely without judgment. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. young people have a they really want to talk to people. Yeah. And it's and I think one of the reasons they were so open with me is I was one of the first adults that ever asked what was going on with yeah. them without an agenda. And they opened right up. All right, so that's it. So you're going to have conversations with loved ones over the holiday break with without judgment. <laughs> we'll write some rules for that when we write up the show. But you know, ask them. Don't assume. I mean, maybe that's the gift to all of us during the holiday season. Assume not. What? This is the only thing you can assume. Assume that everybody's experiencing some sort of political or social outrage and having anxiety over it. That's a safe assumption. Yeah. Like that's we're all there. So. Um, Assume that, but then assume nothing else. Like, and try to meet people where they are and have a have a conversation with no judgment involved. Hmm? I think that's a good social challenge. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. Um, as always, I'm just going to encourage everybody to really have a great time with their family, but just relate with your core curiosities. Just lean into things that you're curious about and create questions around that. And I, you know, there's probably so much information in your own family. Your grandma's probably got some amazing stories that could teach you something, but just relate with your core curiosities. We'll see you next week. <laughs>